Next up, we have Peter Esden Temsky giving a talk called From Idea to Production Using KeyCAD for Open Source Hardware Design and Manufacturing in a, in a Vertically Integrated Company. Peter Esden Temkin is the founder of One Bit Squared and, embedded system, and is an embedded systems engineer and hardware developer with a history of developing open source systems. He is the designer and manufacturer of the One Bit C ARM development board and the Blackmagic Probe, JTAG, SWD programmer, and debugger hardware, and the Icebreaker FPGA development and teaching platform. Please welcome him to the stage. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. All right. So uh, um, this, is, uh, this is me. I already got introduced, so let's... Uh, uh, try moving, one bit squared, uh, that's the company I founded uh, because I didn't want a corporate job. Uh, so um, we are very small, uh, it's uh, basically my wife and me, and um, uh, we, create ded we basically dedicate ourselves to making open source uh, hardware for mostly for projects that don't want to deal with hardware making, like in, in quantity, uh, so sometimes we design the hardware and uh, make it for the project and sell it so that people have access to it. Uh, in other cases, the project designs uh, some hardware, they make some prototypes, but then it's like, oh, dozens of people want it, so we help them to make it into a product so they have access to it. So uh, uh, Blackmagic Probe, uh, Drew already mentioned it. Uh, we worked with uh, Paparazzi UAV. Uh, it's the first open source UAV autonomous autopilot system that was out there. And so we were making hardware for them for a while. Uh, then uh, we are making like uh, logic analyzer for Sigrock that's in the pipeline. And uh, we will be making later this year this Glasgow's. If you know, don't know what it is, you should check what it is. It's amazing. Um, so you, this was, a deep, okay. Uh, and this is the hardware that we are making. It's uh, usually it is very, um, I like small hardware. I hate wasting space on PCBs, so all my stuff ends up very tiny. Uh, and th this is part of the process uh, um, um, constraints that en I end up having. Um, also, we are a little bit weird. We have a pick and place machine. There is a reason for it because, um, because of the sizes of the batches that we make, um, we um, have to work with a manufacturing house really close by so we can go in and fix problems. and. Um, the closest manufacturing house that we had basically was costing us so much money every year that it was cheaper for, and easier for us to actually buy a pick-and-place machine. Uh, so, uh, so we got a quad uh, PNP. It is like an, it was owned by Tyco at some point. There is a company, GoPPM, that make those or refurbish them. It's really old design from the 80s. Uh, it used to run DOS, they, it is converted to Windows XP, haha. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you consider it basically an appliance. It's, uh, you don't update it, you don't touch it, it just runs Windows for some reason. Um, so my history with EDA software, uh, I, my background is actually computer science, so I had, I'm not supposed to do any of this. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, in college, I needed an internship, ended up at a company that had no one who did any software engineering or had computer science background. It were only mechanical engineers and EEs in there. So I taught them processes of how to manage software, and they taught me how to make boards. <laughs> so um, it was like 2004, I dabbled a little bit in ProTel. Then uh, um, long, long nothing Then I did for my diploma thesis. I had to make hardware, started using Eagle. I tried to use uh, GDA PCB back then, uh, as well as a little bit KiCad, but for me the process was so, still clunky enough that uh, I, it was easier to use Eagle. Um, I still prefer always to use open source if it is the right tool, and suddenly in uh, 2015, a friend of mine, Jared Boone, that makes the amazing Portapack, check him out, yay. Um, he like forced me, like, you have to check out nightly builds of KiCad version four. It got much better. 
I tried it, I loved it, and I never uh, looked back. It's really, really an awesome change. Thank you for making it happen. So my first project was, I needed a project, so what I did, I made a, a brushless motor controller, four layers, blind vias, uh, a lot of stitching vias. That was before they, we had free-floating vias. Um, so it, it, it was a fun experience. It was actually enjoyable to learn about the new software and about its quirks, the workarounds, the ways how to get stuff done. So uh, today I want, uh, so that basically is the introduction to it, but um, uh, I want to work, walk you through my process, like skipping all the mundane stuff, how to make a schematic and how to route a board. It's all the corner cases and the weird side things that I have to pay attention to when I make boards, where I have to like, consciously remember to not forget to do these things um, because of my workflow. So asterisk attached to all my opinions uh, here, it's like it might be much harder to do in KiCad than I think. Also, I'm just a user, so take it with a grain of salt. And if you have better processes to uh, fix my, my misconceptions, please tell me. I love learning about uh, weird check marks somewhere in submenus of KiCad. It's very useful. Um, so uh, so okay, we will be going through a few uh, sections. I might need to skip one or two of them because it's only 25 minutes, but it's like setting up a Git repository, creating a KiCad project, reviewing critical settings. That, I think that's an important one. And then I have a panel, how to panelize boards. I made a stream how to do that in KiCad fully without scripts. Um, so we might skip that one. But uh, then component, component annotation and centroid data. This is a specific thing because I have a pick and place machine. Not many people have that experience, but more and more people have uh, open source pick and place machines or cheap Chinese pick and place machines. So this will become more and more important to be actually able to make that transition from KiCad to uh, programming a pick and place machine uh, in the future, I think. <clears throat> so just setting up a GitHub repository, that's easy, but uh, the quirk I have, I, I actually maintain some of my own libraries um, and I use them as a sub-module. This is a great solution to not have a, 50 libraries in each project one that don't sync with each other, you just make a central uh, uh, repository on GitHub where you keep all your libraries for your company or your like, entity and just um, get, to get them as a sub-module for each project. This way uh, it is pinned so it will not break when people check it out, uh, like revision pinned, and also uh, you can make changes and up make updates as you go, you update the libraries, then you know you have to fix something in the schematic. It's a very good process. I think several people that had different processes were uh, actually copied that process and uh, so far they liked it. Um, so um, then uh, we have, uh, um, I tend to basically create uh, subdirectories per revision and this works this way. I create a revision, work on this and make commits to that and then as soon as I generate Gerber files and make a physical object out of that, it's pinned. This directory will never change. It will always be a flat surface, like basically mixing an old style of directories to maintain your project and uh, version control at the same time. This allows you to have a history what changes were made for a, re for a version of a hardware up until it became physical. And then you can refer to the physical object and easily find the design files for that physical object within that repository. This, uh, this worked out pretty well for, for, for me. Um, so um, having to check out some tag somewhere in history of Git is really painful in my opinion. Um, so then uh, uh, I, uh, creating a project, this is a thing I learned actually last, uh, last week from Chris Gamble. It's like there is a check mark that you don't, that not to create a subdirectory it's, uh, it's very useful. 
I, I didn't see it for a while, so I had to like create a directory, copy stuff around. It was a pain, pain in the butt. Uh, and then I have basically a standard set of uh, symbol and FP tables that I copy from project to project, and when you add new libraries, this gets upgraded. But um, the important thing is, is the relative paths. So you have to, the Kikai project mod uh, variable, this Kika does absolute paths, so you have to fix that by hand. And the easiest way is to go into the text file find and replace, so that when people check it out and want to work with your files, they are not like, oh, it is in home as then something something. It's like, I don't have that. So the relative paths this way, it would be probably nice to be able to bulk replace, find and replace within the UI, so you don't have to open the text file, but it's not really a big deal. Uh, so several reasons why I use my own uh, KiCad libraries. Uh, uh, the KiCad libraries in, in KiCad itself are getting better all the time. I was dismissing them because Eagle like, uh, taught me that the uh, delivered libraries are complete crap and useless, so why even bother? So uh, you have to use some other set of libraries like the SparkFun libraries, for example, in Eagle, because otherwise, uh, for a specific example, it's like the footprints within uh, Eagle are larger than they should be, like 0402s, 0603s, and so on. So you get tombstoning when you try to use the default uh, footprints. So you have to use different ones. Um, then uh, I would like to upstream more of the symbols and footprints that I do, but the process is still a little bit opaque to me. I have to learn that. I should do a better job. And especially with 3D models, you need to install a specific version of FreeCAD with specific Python plugins and scripting to be able to do, use the generators for uh, 3D models. And for a casual, oh, I just want to upstream a 3D model, it's very time consuming and very demanding on the user to do that. I'm sure it can be, it will be improved in the future. Uh, the librarians are making big strides in making these processes easier. Um, and especially, I have my own footprint. So this is an inspired actually by SparkFun. Uh, because my designs are very dense, I don't have uh, places for labels. So I, for hand assembly of prototypes, it's useful to at least know, is it a capacitor or a resistor, an inductor or an LED? So uh, then I, I have this like between the pads so it doesn't consume additional space on the board. Uh, you can just uh, have those markers and it's like, oh, it's a circle, so it is a capacitor. And it's sitting next to a square, oh, that's a resistor. So it makes a little bit easier the assembly process by hand when you do prototypes. Okay, so this is the, uh, the part about uh, KiCad settings that I think are very crucial and I cause, caused me several broken boards Many like head scratchings. It's these, this dialogue is the one that caused me the most pain and a lot of people that started. So, uh, SODA mass clearance. The default in KiCad is 0.25. Um, if you think about standard, like pretty much everyone is making PCBs with uh, six, mil, 6 mil trace space, which is 0.15 millimeters. So, if you have that on 0.25, this is what happens you have copper exposed next to the pads. It's like, because you have a fill that is with the normal constraints and suddenly you have copper poking out. So you solder this and you have shorts on the board and you're like, what happened? So um, yeah, I, I think the, the default should be actually zero because the fab houses, they are fine with zero clearance. They will complain if they don't like it. They will open it up for you if they are just feeling lucky. And so, so actually, it, it's safer to have a zero default. But I always have to check if I install KiCad for the first time on a machine. Please don't forget to check your uh, mass clearances. The second one, I don't even remember what the default is, but it is an interesting one. Um, it basically gets rid of the webs between pads. So if you have a pad and you have solder mask between it, and it is too thin, and the manufacturer can't make it or unreliably make it, uh, they will ask you to remove it, or they will remove it themselves in post-processing. Um, the funny thing is, if this is set so that they are, the webs are too thin and they would be removed, KiCad doesn't render that. It still shows the webs. It's only in the Gerber files that you see it. So you have to be very careful. This is why 
uh, I rather would not submit your KiCad files to any manufacturer, check your Gerber files. <laughs> because there are some things that you see in Gerber files that KiCad doesn't render. Uh, so it is better to actually submit uh, um, Gerber files directly. Um, so yeah. Um, next setting is uh, a solder paste. This is something, if you read rules how manufacturers are making stencils, the aperture opening, uh, sometimes you read, it's like, oh yeah, we by default decrease the size of the apertures by 10%. And it's like, I tried this out, and it turned out to be a very bad idea. I think, I'm not sure it is surface. The documents that I read were not very clear. Is it dimensional or surface-based 10% decrease? So it ended up being weird where I had too, too little solder. This photo is not great. I had worse, where like pads were completely unconnected. Um, and, uh, and basically the, the size of the openings are sometimes become so small on the standard small parts, like, 04, in, like the gang resistors, 0402, uh, that the solder paste doesn't actually go through the hole, it actually sticks to the sides of the stencil. So you pull it up and you have just this teeny tiny dollop or it completely doesn't stay on the pad at all. Because by the 10% decrease, it, was, it made it so small that without really good solder paste, like type five solder paste, it will not work. So I made that mistake, don't make that mistake, and this mistake propagated through KiCad projects for me. Because I made it once, and then because how I do my, um, my, my uh, panels, I do append board. And append board was propagating this setting through board, so I had like five boards with stencils that were useless. So be careful with that. So if you use a pen board, always before, have a checklist. Create a checklist of your process. And before you submit the Gerber files, go through the checklist. Check this, options, this, options, this, options. So um, my recommendation to KiCad is like, set those defaults to zero. That would be great. Uh, that is safer than what the defaults are current, currently. I had several people that started using KiCad and their first board had shorts because of the 0.25 issue. Um, all right, um, then panelization. I will really try to rush through this one. Um, I basically take a board, I select it, cre use the create array tool, uh, then I make a frame of five millimeters around it, then, uh, uh, then I can add, um, uh, add tabs. You will see the tabs added to here. And then uh, you can, ch so use a uh, the array tool. Do not use cut and paste. The important thing is like array keeps the nets on the, on the traces and pads and everything. If you use cut and paste, it removes all the nets. It like gets rid of all the nets. And so it just will break your complete design. The, the whole fills, like ground fills, will all disconnect from all vias, disconnect from everything. Uh, I fortunately caught that before I submitted anything, so that, uh, but uh, cut and paste was added as a really awesome new feature, and I was like, oh, I can cut and paste for my panels. No, you can't. You have to use array. Um, uh, yeah, so you can use it as a template, the, the frame. You, can, you just draw it once, um, and then you can remove the boards and put them back in. It doesn't take too much. It's like half an hour to update a board. Uh, it's relatively okay. Um, one thing that I skipped over here is like vScore. I don't use vScore, I mostly use tap route. Uh, vScore requires, I think, an additional me mechanical layer. That would be uh, like going to the last thing with like, oh, what I would like to have seen KiCad is like uh, arbitrary named uh, mechanical layers. That would be very useful. Uh, especially it's like vScore or like internal cutouts. Sometimes manufacturers want them as separate Gerber files. So that would be great to name them accordingly to what they actually are and not use like eco1, eco2 or whatever uh, as layers for that. Uh, another thing is when you add the tabs, you already have the board outline and the board outline will overlap with the tabs. You have to cut out, basically split the outline of the board so that the tab comes together. Um, it would be nice if polygons had some Boolean uh, functions and have in footprints because the tabs, I use footprints as templates for those tabs so I can place them easily uh, all around the board. 
it would be great to, uh, um, to be able to do edge cuts in footprints. I think it is coming in six, I, actually. It's like, I, I think it is on the way. Um, yeah, so the last thing, so I'm not sure it is la last thing or not, but uh, for example, for my management of the whole process from uh, creation to production, I have to, uh, I, I can lay out the board or like make the schematic, lay out the board, choose parts, uh, that's fine. But eventually I need to start making a bill of materials, see that I have, I'm mostly using parts that I, I try to keep the amount of different parts that I use for different projects as minimal as possible because this decreases the inventory and the more, if you can have five projects using one part, you increase the amount of that part you need and thus uh, you can buy it in bigger bulk so it, it becomes cheaper. Uh, so this is a good process to have somewhere a database, a central database of uh, the parts you are using in your company. And so uh, I solved it, it's still, if you want to make a lifetime software that I can pay 25 bucks a month for, please do it. I would pay in a blink of an eye, but currently it's just spreadsheets on Google Docs. Um, but I need the keys to manage which part it is. So the key is just a string. They look basically like that. They are human readable, easy to type, um, and they serve as keys to connect my pick and place machine programming with my spreadsheets and database and my schematic. And I use the schematic, uh, um, um, the, the arbitrary fields or the custom fields inside. So I add a key field there and it, and it manages that and it's version controlled, it's great. And yeah, so these are the parts. Uh, I want them to be non-redundant, so the information inside the string is not uh, copy, is, doesn't have redundant information to keep them short. It's like, that's probably my programming background. <laughs> it's like, make the strings of function names short. Um, this is how the tables look like for the spreadsheet. It's basically, uh, in KiCad I can set them. Thank you for uh, putting the spreadsheet editor for the fields in KiCad. That, is, that was such a great feature. So simplified my pro, uh, process a lot. And then, uh, then uh, the bomb in the spreadsheet, and then uh, having a global part list, and you can link one, one sheet to another, and then you can make calculations it's like, are they in stock? Do I, uh, um, do I need that part? Is it ordered? And like, I can flag them. Then I can have like build spreadsheet where it's like, I need to build 50. Uh, I have so many parts, do I need this part? Do I have too little of reels that I ordered? So it allows some management of that. Uh, it is not very automated, it's a bit quite clunky. I wish there was some dedicated software for that that wouldn't cost arm and a leg. Um, so for the pick and place machine, that's the interesting part. So there, the machine, this is the simple import. There are much more advanced formats that this uh, software also accepts that with much more information in there. So this is per one board, and I have to make the duplication for the panels myself, but uh, the, just the bare basics would be a footprint reference, so U1, U2, or C1, C2, C3, and so on. Part name, so that the machine knows what is the part, how big it is, how has it to be handled, what type of a feeder does it need. It has an internal database inside the pick and place software, so this is the reference that keys into that database. And then position and rotation of the part. It's pretty easy, but um, I couldn't write a Python script, but it's like, I think it should be easier than that. I don't know, it's, I, I, was, I was so lazy that I basically made my life harder. <laughs> uh, so export bomb, export position file, and then combine it in a spreadsheet. It's easy enough, but it would be nice if just the, the custom fields from the schematic were propagated to the, to the board file and I could just export the POS file with the additional columns that I need. Uh, it's pretty much this flexible bill of materials exporter with the scripts that is in the schematic, have that in the board file so that you have access to the positions of the parts, that would be really, really sweet. Exactly what I would need for this. Um, so, final thoughts. <laughs> uh, as I already said, 
KiCat is awesome and it's getting better every day. Uh, I really enjoy that. Uh, I'm very thankful to the like, dedicated developers, the community, like sharing all this information about their processes, about their weirdnesses. The Twitter community is amazing. It's like you post something, it's like, I have a problem with XXX. You get just answers like, what? here, do this, do try this, try that. It's awesome. Um, I, I'm not sure other software has as much of an active and help like mutually helpful community. Um, librarians, great job. Uh, documenters, also amazing. And uh, thank you for putting everything you have into that project. And my like call out that I try to make to those that are using the software commercially, if you're using the software commercially, like uh, I am, uh, if you use the software before that you replaced with it, Consider like taking the fees that you would be paying for that previous software, if you can, and donate it to CERN. It does help and pushes the software forward. It's basically putting the money where, you, where your mouth is. It's like it, it really helps. I don't have time to contribute like developer time to the project. Uh, I try to use the nightly so that I find the bugs early so I can write at least bug reports for it. This is another really great way of contributing to the project. And it's also a lot of fun. It's like my, my experience was so far really amazing where I ran into some simple problem, some weird quirk that I ran into. If you r spend this half an hour on a bug report that is like well written and easy, easy to reproduce by a developer, it doesn't take much time to get fixed. So it, they almost immediately get to it and fix it and there is a patch and it's very exciting. It's like, oh yes! It's fixed, it's awesome, thank you so much. So consider doing that. Um, also, if you are any other type of creator, write a blog post about something that either bugs you or you found out, or it is very useful to have that, that, that resource. Mark definitely the version of KiCat you are referring to because this might change. Uh, but otherwise, it's very useful. It's like the videos from Chris Gamo, I think, are very useful. But the more the merrier, I think. All right, so thank you very much for having me and making this amazing conference. Uh, it's, uh, I had really awesome conversations here, and thank you very much. So if you have any questions, I think we might, for we have a few minutes. Uh, to the last point, or second and last point on the last slide, um, to when you're evaluating uh, bleeding edge versions in a commercial setting, uh, how, how do you do this to avoid breaking your designs? Are you, are you uh, loading them uh, separately, or, or how, how, do you, uh, how do you manage testing projects in a commercial setting? Um, I'm not exactly sure I understand your question. I'm sorry. Right. Um, you... Uh, you're advocating for uh, people to test the latest version and to file bug reports. Oh, and this is very, so I see. In your, how, are you, how are you managing that uh, internally? This is a balance act. And uh, I usually, my, tech, my like, view on this is like, I, I follow the developer mailing list. I'm just a spectator. I try to like, stay out of the developer's hair. They, I, this is not my position, uh, unless there's something like, I actually have to add to this. But uh, I. I see it's like, oh, they froze the version before going, going to, to stabilization. So the nightlies are probably stable enough to use. And then I try it out. It's like, make a copy of the file, <laughs> or, like, just, or don't save. And then it's like, play around with it. It's like, okay, okay, this feels good. Now, and if you, it crashes, that's a bug report. And, uh, and uh, then you can go back to the stable version, especially if you are on Linux, you can install the nightly build parallel to the KiCad version, which is also a new development, which is really awesome. Uh, and basically have that parallel to each other, try out new things, poke around with it. And if you feel comfortable, it's, I try to save my files on a regular basis and commit also very regularly. So if I break something, it won't cost me more than an hour, maybe, so it's not end of the world. 
unless I'm really under the gun, then I will definitely not use the nightly build. Yeah, but it's like if I have the time, I can invest. It's basically a part, it's like giving money to CERN, that's another way of contributing to the project. All right, if there's more questions, uh, we can take them in the back room. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. <laughs>